let's get started on here. Learning objectives, basically uh, walk through the econ impact capabilities within LifeSim uh, and we'll briefly touch on some of the other consequence considerations, but really focusing on economic loss here. So why are we interested in this? Like, hey, and you say it's a damn life safety program, we always say life loss is paramount. Um, but that doesn't mean economic loss is irrelevant. It can make uh, an impact on the margin sometimes, especially once you get into a modification phase of a study. If you're trying to figure out what's the most efficient way to reduce risk, uh, sometimes the economic damages that would uh, occur downstream can become relevant, especially if you're doing something like modifying a spillway. If you're looking at like uh, widening it or something like that, that might induce some downstream damages, it could be important information to have. So what uh, type of economic consequences are considered? The main thing obviously is gonna be the direct economic loss of when you flood a structure, that's a loss to the nation. Uh, there used to be property value there that is now going to be literally washed away. Other sources can also be agricultural losses, though, uh, and then sometimes we consider the indirect loss of, you know, you flood out a business, that business is no longer there to serve its customers. Uh, there's going to be disruption to the economy in that way as well. Uh, we'll consider sometimes, at least within USACE, other uh, categories like you know, that dam is no longer there to provide its hydropower benefits or water supply or whatever the function of that dam was, you know, if it's now breached and incapable of providing those benefits, that's not uh, included within LifeSim, however. LifeSim really focuses on those direct damages to structures or agriculture, and then also to a lesser extent, the indirect losses. So what matters for direct economic loss? Uh, it's a lot of the same structure characteristics. It's a lot of the same categories that are relevant for your life loss considerations, right? So structure location, you know, where that structure is placed, what depths and velocities you're bringing in matter just as much to direct, you know, damage to the structure as they do to life loss. It's just instead of focusing on the population that's in those buildings, you're focusing on how much was that structure worth, how much was the content of the structure worth, and then ditto for things like agriculture. So, you know, here's a ready example, and you guys have been playing around with some life some examples the past few days. So if you have an inventory like those on the left where you have structures placed, you know, in these canals and whatnot, you're gonna get bogus depths and velocities. You're gonna have elevated consequences for your econ losses just like you would uh, for your life loss consequences. So you really need to make sure that whatever inventory you're bringing in there accurately you know, adequately uh, reflects what's actually at risk. So how does economic loss work within LifeSim? Uh, well, you know, we've talked a lot about structure stability so far, right? So if a structure is washed away, uh, you know, for life loss, we say, well, now they're in a high lethality situation. Well, for economic loss, if, if we think a structure is lost, washed away, then we really assume that that structure loses 100% of its value. So if that house was worth you know, $100,000 and then it gets washed away, well, now it's worth zero. So we assume $100,000 worth of damage to the economy. So again, you know, things like what it, whether or not it's wood frame or masonry are still gonna be important for economic, just like it was for life loss. So if it's not washed away, however, then we go to something called a depth damage function. And here we'll you know, also be considering the first floor elevation, again, just like with life loss, you know, whether or not you get above that uh, foundation height, you know, above into the first floor is really gonna affect the damages that occur. But you basically take that depth, you uh, go to this curve and say, my depth is five feet, and then that will have an associated percent damage uh, for, for whatever occupancy type you're looking at. So just a little bit of example on that, you know, your first floor elevation and water depth. So here we're kind of looking at an example where, uh, you know, if we assume this black bar is uh, the, the water level, you know, every single structure in here, their first floor elevation is above uh, that black bar. So we would expect zero damages at that point. But as water creeps up, you know, if you have a really low foundation height, you would start to see damages at those structures with the heights. Uh, 
you know, the, the further up the water goes, obviously, the more damages you would expect, um, but that damage will ramp up considerably if you have a low foundation height compared to a higher foundation height. And if you're in a single story structure compared to a two story structure, so things like your contents being on the second floor would reduce damages compared to if all your contents were just on a first floor. So again, you know, pretty simple math uh, for this sort of calculation. There's usually curves um, that you'll pull into life sim that will have just, you know, a single input depth. If you're, you know, assuming again that the structure isn't washed away and then a single, you know, output uh, that dollar value just using the percent damage sort of function. So where do these curves come from? Uh, a variety of different sources, traditionally in core economics, you know, if you're planning on building a new levy, you spend a lot of time coming up with uh, depth damage functions that are appropriate. In your depth damage function, uh, some of those omitted variables get wrapped in there. But how do those curves get created? You know, sometimes people will do things like expert elicitations. So you get some people that are claims adjusters, contractors on a rim together, and you say, if this type of structure was flooded by, you know, half a foot, what kind of damages we expect? And like, okay, well, at a point, the electrical might be disrupted or drywall issues might occur. And you can get it five feet. Okay, well, at that point, we lose even more of the structures. So those sorts of process could be done. Or, you know, you might use empirical data where it's like, okay, we have FEMA claims data that actually for this particular event, we know the depths that occur at those structures and how much people uh, said they lost and how much they filed for their claim. And then we'll say, okay, well, now we actually have real world data we can use to create some of these curves. Or you can do synthetic curves or some sort of combination of that where it's like, okay, I mathed it out and it makes sense that this kind of curve would apply for this particular situation. Within the core, a lot of the curves we'll use are these EGM curves, Economic Guidance Memorandum. Uh, this is basically, you know, an analysis done by the, cur by the core around 2003 or so, I want to say, using claims data. And these are approved curves that are widely used across the core for single family houses. Uh, for non-residential structures, it's usually a grab bag of what core economists will use, depending again on their region and the type of flood hazard they're looking at. So here's an example of some of those EGM curves. Um, it breaks it out by one story, two story, with basement, without. And these sort of, uh, you know, again, your structure attributes will have a pretty big impact on the damages that occur. So you can kind of look at this one story, no basement versus with basement example. This is flooding at zero feet. And so if you don't have a basement, zero feet of depth means it's right there to the threshold of your door, not really entering the structure proper, but maybe it's like messing with your crawl space or something like that. So there are some damages. But if you have a basement, flood is going through your basement window, flooding your, your furnace you might have down there, any sort of contents and structure, you know, drywall you might have in a finished basement, for example. So that sort of classification would have a huge impact on damages, assuming you know, every single structure in your inventory is getting flooded out. In this example, you know, it goes from 13% damage to 25% damage, which is really a 90% increase in your damages. So it can really matter in those sort of shallow depths or situations. And again, if you're doing like a traditional benefit cost analysis, that could be a critical assumption. You know, the distribution of structures in your area that have basements and those that don't. And also the distribution of where those basements are located. Are they all concentrated in one neighborhood? Okay, then maybe it makes sense to build a levy there and not over here, if, as opposed to if they're just randomly distributed across the study area. As depths increase, generally, you know, these sorts of damages, uh, you know, you'll see sl bit, uh, smaller and smaller, you know, marginal increases in the percent depths and it will have less of an impact uh, on the sensitivity of your results. How do these EGM curves compare between the single family curves and some of the other curves we use for other types of residential structures? Res twos are mobile homes, res threes are multifamily structures. You can see one, well, uncertainty is only included in the default curves for single family structures. Those are the most common structure types. Again, there's been more research on that. Um, the default curves in YSIM don't have uncertainty for anything else, basically. So if you want to include uncertainty, as is required by a lot of core guidance, you're going to have to modify that yourself. 
Yeah, you'll have to, you know, either make some assumptions or go out and find other curves that have uncertainty embedded in them. You can also see the shape of the curve kind of differs. Uh, why is that? Um, well, maybe it's just based on how, like, the data that was used to create this, and these differences aren't real, or maybe it's based on the building type that's really common among these type of structures. So res 5 and 6s, those are things like uh, institutional dormitories or prisons and things like that. That's going to have different construction types than your single family structures, which are largely wood frame. You know, if you have concrete blocks and everything, that could be less damaged than your drywall. So depth damages is going to be different. What about content? Uh, similar idea. Uncertainty is only included in the single family curves. And you can kind of see for these semi commercial, let's say here, uh, categories. Damages ramp up pretty quickly. You know why that might be? I don't know. Maybe people in single-family homes try to salvage uh, their contents more than people in commercial areas, where it's like, oh, I can't sell this. I'm just going to toss it, basically. So here's some of those non-residential curves. Again, very similar shape to some of those uh, multifamily and institutional sort of curves we were seeing in the residential section. Uh, and then for vehicles, you can kind of see on the x-axis here, we're looking at much smaller depths. So you reach 100% damage, we're assuming, after just three feet of depth. But again, no uncertainty included in this. So where is uncertainty embedded? Well, there's nothing uh, in the default curves, but you can set a variety of different uh, uncertainty parameters within LISM itself. You know, uh, let me go over my mouse. You can set it on the foundation height for all your different structures that get at the octantile level. You can set uncertainty around the value of the structure as well. Say, okay, here's my best estimate. I think it's worth $100,000, but you can vary from that, you know, 10 to 20% or whatever have you uh, for any particular iteration. You can also do the same thing for content value and vehicle value. So, what isn't included? Well, I said pretty much the only thing that's included explicitly is the depth. That means we're missing out on things like the duration of the flooding, salinity, humidity, time to reentry. Why would that matter? Well, you know, mold and other things can really occur if there's long duration flooding, uh, time to reentry. So if you get in there and you immediately start to repair your structure, it probably has a better chance of surviving long term than if it sits there for weeks on end. Again, allowing some of that mold and other sort of things to become a factor. If you're in a coastal area, things like, you know, a road and a wave height can really affect whether or not that structure will survive. Uh, and if for things like content damage, you know, is there an opportunity for intervention? You know, if you get a warning and you know a flood is coming, maybe you'll move some of the contents from the first floor to your second, or you'll drive your vehicle up to some hill, or you'll pack a lot of stuff in your car and drive off to safety. So there's lots of things that aren't uh, include it directly within LISIM. It doesn't mean that you don't have the capability to adding some of those things in. You know, like, hey, I'm in this coastal area where so many other things are different. I'm going to modify the default depth damage curves to something else that's more appropriate for my region. Agricultural damage. So we talked a little bit about this in the last class, the constants class. You know, this is a function within LISIM. You can theoretically import data from NAS, National Agricultural Statistics Service. Uh, basically, we'll bring in a TIF, uh, you know, geospatial data about where crops are located, and you can start to do uh, an analysis on how those crops are damaged. You know, we're talking a little bit before during the workshop that this isn't too common in the core, but there's like really specialized people where, hey, I have an agricultural levy where this is important. I'd say for the most part, we don't look into this too much to the extent where we're kind of like, hey, does this import from NAS even work right now in live sim? Oh, we haven't tested in a while. We think the API. But still works. Uh, basic idea with agriculture is that instead of depth, duration matters a lot more. So the longer that water is up high on the crops, the more likely it is that that crop will be a loss. Agriculture is also kind of complicated because it really matters like when that crop is planted. You know, if they don't plant a crop until April, but it floods in March, then you're going to have vastly different impacts than if, you know, that flood came along in May. 
And the more the farmers invest into that crop, the more, like, you know, okay, I not only planted it, but I fertilized it, I've done less worse stuff, the more loss uh, there could be, the less opportunity that they would have to plant something else that could substitute in for that crop uh, in the planting season. So there's a lot of seasonal based value, seasonal based damages. It really matters on when you assume the flood is coming through. So I won't spend too much longer on here unless we have people that are really interested in agricultural damage, because again, this is kind of a niche subject. But there are capabilities in here to kind of interesting and getting a little bit more traction within the core of like, hey, we're not just interested in whether or not a business is flooded, but if it is, how does that disrupt the regional and potentially national economy? You know, and if any of you have had Econ 101, you can kind of recognize some of these charts on the left, supply, demand, et cetera. So if you go through and you flood out a whole bunch of wheat, how will that impact, you know, the price of bread? Uh, how will that impact, et cetera? You know, a lot of us can kind of say, like, eh, it's unlikely that it would impact the national economy. Like, even if you're talking, like, a fairly major flood, there's lots of other places that grow uh, the same crops, usually. Sometimes you'll have specialty crops that only grow in a particular region, and if a massive enough flood comes along, maybe you would really knock out a significant portion of, like, almond production or something like that in America. It could have a wider impact. Uh, some of this might become more relevant for those sorts of things. Uh, but again, these are going to be fairly specialized cases for the most part. Uh, it's important to consider some of these sort of things, especially if you know, like, hey, uh, this would flood the sole manufacturer of some product that's critical for U.S. supply lines. And we've kind of seen in the past few years, supply lines can be tricky. Sometimes we assume in economics things work out and you're unlikely to have national impacts, but real world can get pretty messy. So the basic idea here, though, is that you would say, well, here's the total amount of capital and labor that is available in my study area. You know, here's a total value of like structures uh, for you know commercial purposes or what have you in my county, uh, and here's the percent that's lost uh, based on my modeling. You would get this sort of fraction in here. You'd run through these things called input-output models that basically say, okay, uh, this is what it would trigger on the you know downstream economy and whatnot. And here's how you know again the supply and demand would likely start shifting, and you can start to see what's the indirect uh, economic impact of this. Sometimes you'll hear phrases like regional economic development within the core. Again, those are sort of things that get a lot less play than the national economic development, which we usually assume are things like damages to structures. But, you know, again, here's an example of indirect economics. This is a Nashville flood. You can start to see like, A, uh, obviously there's damages to structures going on here. You can see a lot of buildings that are flooded. But what does this do to recreation? You know, Nashville, big, uh, you know, a lot of visitors come to the area, bring a lot of money. Uh, if a flood like this is going on, that can't happen. So there's going to be impacts to that regional economy uh, and, you know, people's utility that they get from that sort of recreation. All right. So summary of some of these different categories. Again, uh, direct economic damages gets most of the attention. And there's ways for computing it with with collapse and without collapse. If you're talking without collapse, you know, fancy French going on here, uh, you, then you're pretty much just interested in what's the max depth of that structure. But if you are considering collapse, which Lyson does, then you are interested in both the max depth times velocity at any particular moment. It will pull that information directly from the HDF file. Agricultural damages, again, you're more interested in duration and the timing of flooding, indirect. Hey, it's complicated, but you have to have things like, you know, the total amount of capital and labor in there, and then you'll use the direct damages to try to infer how that would be disruptive. So how is uncertainty handled within LISIM? Well, I talked about that a little bit with the direct things, right? By default, it's only going to be included in things like, oh, here's maybe I think at three feet, single family homes get damaged at 30%, but I have a standard deviation around that. so. I'll sample that and, and you'll get some uncertainty modeled in here. But by default, again, not every occupancy type has that in there. You'll have to supply that yourself. Uh, by default, there's no uncertainty on uh, foundation height. So you'll, again, you have to 
So we're also within Wysum itself. Hey, it's a single event model. You're not doing things like uh, FDA, uh, uh, at least within the model itself, where you go through and say, I have uncertainty around you know, my flow and how often that will occur over the course of uh, my 50 year study period analysis. I have uncertainty around given a certain flow, what the stage would be. I have uncertainty around uh, given a certain stage, what the damage would be, and therefore I have this total uncertainty uh, for economic damages. What you more commonly will do with using LISIM is build out some sort of event tree. And so a lot of that uncertainty will have to be embedded within the nodes. Again, you know, if you're doing a life loss study, you're setting something like this up already. And I think maybe we're talking about that in the last day, uh, you know, using tools like total risk, which is coming out more and more for RMC to kind of set up something like this. Focusing on that, and that's what I'm supplying to the risk modeler. But then they'll ask me at the end, they like, oh, can you also give me the econ damages for those same scenarios? So that will all be wrapped up together. You don't have to do too much extra effort, at least if you're doing direct damages, uh, to get some econ estimates out of here on top of uh, the life loss numbers. Loss benefits. So these are all things like I mentioned. You know, if the dam is no longer there, it's not providing the hydropower, etc. Uh, so these are all real losses to the nation potentially not included in life sim. You know, we talked a little bit about this in the last consequence course. There's other methods you can do to try to get out these if these are critical, and sometimes they can be. You know, if you have a runner over the dam with very little uh, flooding, you know, downstream to people and their property, but, you know, no more hydropower, that could be a significant benefit that you're interested in, just not covered here. So again, um, for economic risk, when does it become relevant? Well, we don't have the same tolerable risk guidelines that we do within USACE for life loss. Sometimes it may matter. You know, maybe you're looking at a few different dams. Uh, they all plot differently. Yeah, sorry, that's a lot of busy information. But we'll prioritize dams within USACE based on the DSAC. You know, DSAC 1, high priority. DSAC 4, 5, very low priority. If you're looking at a few dams and they're pretty close in life loss, maybe if one has a lot higher economic damages, that would be the deciding reason to maybe prioritize that slightly higher. Uh, this starts to matter more, like I mentioned, if you're doing some sort of modification study and you're looking at like, hey, I'm considering doing a pool restriction. Uh, should I do that? Well, for life loss reasons, why not? Um, but we have to recognize sometimes that we live in a world where a lot of people have a lot of different interests. If I'm going to have an impact to people that are recreating in that lake, who regularly go to that community and spend money at the local gas station and grocery store, that has real impacts to people, their livelihoods, et cetera. This can become hugely important to stakeholders within areas. And so this starts to be captured more, again, once you get into some sort of alternative analysis for how you want to reduce risk at a particular project. So that's where we kind of talked about four accounts within USACE. NED, you know, if you're not in the USA, sorry. NED, National Economic Development, RED, Regional Economic Development. You know, again, this is, is an impact to the whole nation, like, you know, flooding a structure. Okay, the nation is short one, uh, one fewer structures. Or is this a regional distribution? And my fl flood one business, and now business has to go across the street to another competitor. So I go to the nation didn't lose anything. That's more of a regional impact. Environmental quality can be important. You know, am I flooding some area that's spreading contaminants across a wide area? Uh, there might be some sort of cleanup costs associated with that. There might be disruption to, you know, vulnerable species. Uh, if I'm doing a pool restriction, maybe that will have some sort of impact to species downstream, upstream, et cetera. Other social effects. You know, this is where life loss is really located within core decision making. You know, other social effects is a huge grab bag. Uh, so life loss, obviously, highly used for decision making, especially within the dam levy safety program. But things like social vulnerability are also getting a lot more attention, at least within our framework. Environmental justice, a big federal push in recent years to say, like, hey, are we allocating federal spending to some of these disadvantaged groups? Some of this analysis can become important, and obviously you'll have to bring in econ for some of those sort of discussions.